Welcome to the IDC Radio at 106.2 FM. I'm Anouk Lori. Today is the final day of the annual summit of the International Institute for Counterterrorism at the IDC. The summit deals with the terrorism's with terrorism's global impact and ways to deal with it. And here with me are some of the world's leading experts on terrorism. Some. Uh, today we commemorate the 12th anniversary of the September 11th uh, attacks. How different is the world of international terrorism today than it was then? Uh, we'll start with you. And this reminds me, I definitely should introduce you. I have uh, on my right Commissioner Adrian Lepard, uh, who is Commissioner of the City of London Police in the United Kingdom. Uh, next to him is Professor Robert Friedman, who is the founding director of the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange and professor of criminal justice at Georgia State University. Uh, did I say that correctly? Yes. Awesome. And then we have Dr. Daphne Richmond Barak, senior researcher and head of the Terrorism and International Law Desk at the International Institute for Counterterrorism here at the IDC. Uh, so uh, repeating my question, how is uh, the world of international terrorism different today than it was on September the 11th, 2001? Well, I think, I mean, terrorism is an interesting subject. It's the ability to influence governments um, through some shocking act. And I don't think we'll ever rid uh, society or the world of people who want to influence government. Uh, but if we look at September 11th to where we are now, uh, certainly I talk from a British perspective. You know, our response to that has to build capability to work better with communities. And it's forced us into a much better engagement with people who we think may be the problem. Uh, and the problem in Britain now is less an international threat reaching down that's commanded from another country more people who are potentially radicalized, violent extremists, we call, you know, who may very quickly decide they want to attack our country. And that's our focus, to work with communities, mm -hmm. but also to get uh, better at how we respond to a threat should it arrive. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, across the world, I think all agencies and governments are better equipped. That doesn't mean to say it's a safer place, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. um, Robert, I, I think that one of the big differences uh, uh, between now and then Uh, is is in many ways the decentralization of power uh, from uh, uh, an international terrorist movement with a clear leader and, and, and a clear uh, uh, organization to uh, uh, something which is perhaps more decentralized but makes it more difficult in many ways to uh, to track. Uh, so it's uh, uh, harder for the intelligence community, perhaps, to track and stop terrorists, which is why many of the attacks on U.S. soil since September 11th have been lone gunmen as opposed to huge uh, uh, terrorist, uh, terror attacks by larger groups. Um, do you agree that that's one of the main changes between now and then? Well, to some extent, yes, but I'm not fully sure that some of the definitions that you used are really applicable. Because I, I don't accept the notion of the lone wolf, uh, because a lone wolf implies that somebody acts in a vacuum and they suddenly decide to, you know, take arms, so to speak, and have an attack. I prefer to talk rather than on lone wolves. I prefer to talk about uh, terrorist-inspired activities rather than terrorist-initiated activities. Mm -hmm. So the activities uh, of the, the atrocities of September 11 were clearly terrorist initiated, very organized. The terrorist uh, inspired activities since 1980, I can document three dozen cases, fairly prominent cases, where each of them were defined as a lone wolf activity that there's a trouble inside the head of the individual. Or if you take the example of Fort Hood, mm. it's a workplace violence. These kinds of definitions basically are doing a disservice to the West because if I have a internal problem, I would try to resolve it in some way that even if I'm crazy, so to speak, the damage that is done is not one that then influences governments. Mm -hmm. But if you go and attack an airline counter because you have some feud with your boss, as LAX is an example, or uh, the Boston bombing, That is an entirely different uh, issue. And if you're asking about the difference between September 11, we now all take absolutely for granted that when we go to an airport, we have to assume the position, mm -hmm. namely being searched. 
before September 11, we took for granted that if I would have the commissioner as my guest, I can go easily to the gate and pick him up. Not anymore. Uh, and, and I think if, if you go back to John Alderson's definition of policing, it's the guaranteeing of the freedom of passage of people and merchandise. Right. And in that sense, terrorism has already succeeded in curbing that liberty of the freedom of passage uh, movement of people and merchandise. Mm -hmm. Daphne, do you believe that the same tools uh, uh, the commissioner was talking about, uh, terrorism at home and not just on a global scale, do you believe the same tools can uh, be used to deal both with homegrown terrorism and with global terrorism? Um, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a very good question, and that's actually one of the major questions that the international legal community um, has had to face since September 11, and um, deciding what is exactly the toolbox from a legal perspective, but of course this translates into uh, the ability to use lethal force against terrorists. Mm -hmm. So what is the legal uh, rationale under which you'll be able to actually fight terrorism? And will it be using the toolbox of human rights law or law enforcement within a national state? State, or will it be using uh, the laws of war, um, which apply in armed conflict in a state of war? Um, uh, and that's that's a, a challenge that ha that was that was raised by September 11, and that we are still today uh, struggling with. And there is no clear answer today as to what is precisely the, the toolbox. And it and it could very well be that you need a different toolbox. Uh, uh, f from the legal perspective, whether you're dealing with homegrown terrorism or whether you're dealing with global terrorism. But also the problem is that it's not always easy to make this very distinction between homegrown and global mm -hmm. terrorism. So in other words, uh, because it's a global threat, uh, but which can manifest itself locally, then you need to find the right tools for that and you need to determine what is the extent to which you'll be able to use force. And that unfortunately is something that is made extremely difficult uh, because the, the, le the these toolbox were created for a very different reality. And today we need to use them uh, for very different situations. And that's, that's a concern and that's a challenge for mm -hmm. sure. Commissioner, I know that on, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're dealing obviously with the policing of, of uh, the city of London, mm. uh, but do you believe uh, that the West, uh, in particular the U.S. and the U.K., has been successful in its counterterrorism measures? Oh yeah, there's no doubt we've been successful because I, you know, we know in Britain alone that there has been a major an attack that's been thwarted every year since 9/11 um, through intelligence gathering and effective work of the security services and the police. Uh, I go back to this issue about how important communities are because. In nearly every case, uh, the intelligence and the information started from people in the communities who want to protect communities, and the police just act on that. Mm -hmm. We talked about the toolbox earlier. I mean, the British counterterrorism strategy has got four approaches to it, and two of them are about trying to target the threat, uh, and we, we call that pursue, um, and another one called prevent, and that's trying to change the ideology or, or going upstream to where the threat is. But the other two parts of that, protect and prepare, are all about making sure our vulnerable locations are um, protected from attack. And that's a lot of work goes into that. The whole critical national infrastructure as well as transport infrastructure. And then most importantly, what we call our prevent strategy. Mm -hmm. And that's working in local communities, uh, our Muslim communities, uh, working in universities, places we know where radicalism starts to surface. So people, and, and we know, don't we, that 99.9% .9 of the population are, you know, abhorred by any sort of violence and want to protect society. You know, we need to encourage them to help us with that mm -hmm. uh, and be able to reach outside of their communities to talk to us. So we've tried to build those bridges, and it's taken a long time, but we've, I think we've built trust in mosques, with imams, and with a whole range of other communities. But that's vital, uh, I think, to protect in homeland security in any country. Mm -hmm. Do you feel uh, uh, in London that radicalization and, and it's been a front page issue for the last however many years, has it uh, been increasing or, or decreasing uh, uh, since you took over as, uh, as a commissioner? So I'm, I'm commissioner of the City of London, that's the financial district, right. one square mile. Uh, but I've, you know, talking broadly from the UK, um, Violent extremism, which is a term we prefer to use rather than radicalization, um, has always been a very small minority uh, of predominantly the Muslim faith. Um, 
you know, that, that number won't change. What we need to do is make sure we stop the conversion of people who feel strongly to people who want to take action to intervene with society, to break laws and to kill people. Mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's no law against, in a, in a democratic free society, for people to feel very strongly, very passionately about anything, including their religion. It's when it reaches and breaks that law against human rights for someone else's liberty that it becomes an mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Professor uh, Friedman, how do you feel about the U.S.'s uh, uh, approach to counterterrorism uh, today? Is it, is it effective? Well, you're putting me on a spot because if I say that it's not effective, it's dangerous. If I say if it is effective, I'd be lying. So I, I, I think it's somewhere in between. I would, to be fair, I would say that compared to where the U.S. has been in 2001, uh, we are ways ahead, but there's still a long way to go, and here's why. The asymmetric warfare that is imposed on the free Western societies is posing two issues on us. Uh, one is the asymmetry of the attack, namely they need to succeed once or twice and law enforcement needs to succeed 100% of the time. These are not odds that are in our favor because statistically, even without getting into any regression analysis, odds are that they will have a successful attack. And since my background is academic, if I would, as an academic, give a grade to September 11, it would be probably an A minus, not because I like what they did, but from an operational perspective, mm -hmm. other than the one plane that failed, mm -hmm. they were very successful. And it changed the way the, not only the Western, everybody around the world is, is dealing with. The second issue that I think is, to me, of a greater concern is not whether the country is able or unable to protect its citizens because it's a relative measure of protection. You can't have a insurance policy that is 100% successful all the time. It's the continuum or conflict, depending on how you look at it, between privacy and civil liberties and security. I'm by no means a bleeding heart liberal, but the problem I have is that I see security-minded people who are only concerned about security and they do not look at civil liberties as an issue. Mm. Then I see the civil libertarians who only care about civil liberties and they are not caring about security. That is a crucial mistake because those two values in society have to coexist. And if they will not, we'll end up having neither. Mm -hmm. uh, Daphne, do you think that laws that Western countries have adopted uh, since 9-11 are effective enough in uh, countering terrorism? Um, if you if you just uh, allow me, I'd like to just follow up on Professor Friesen's sure. last, last point about the civil liberties slash security um, uh, gap. And uh, we actually, in, in uh, about two months ago at ICT, we had a conference which was devoted to the topic of law and security, in which we were precisely trying to, to bridge this, this gap and, and to try to actually bring together experts uh, in civil liberties, human rights, and in security. And this is what we do at ICT in general, and that's what's also what's going on during the conference. So I, I, I can only strengthen the importance of, of, of that. Uh, with respect to, to, to the legal framework and, and how we fight terror using the law, because that actually is, is, uh, is also the, the same uh, overarching topic we, we just touched upon. Uh, the laws that we have at the international level to deal with, with terrorism are laws that were drafted and designed for very different situations, for state-to-state -state wars and not for um, uh, fighting uh, ter terrorist organizations that are non-state actors but which have very uh, high capabilities and, um, and, and can inflict danger at the level uh, uh, that a state could as well. Um, so the, the, the difficulty has been to take this, this law, these laws that were uh, drafted for very different purposes and try to apply them to an entirely new situation. Very soon after September, September 11, there was this sense that perhaps we should take the laws and replace them with other laws and perhaps that would solve our problems. And then we'd have actually very well-crafted laws to deal with the problem of terrorism, both domestically uh, but also internationally. 
And that was, there was this debate going on. Should we adopt a new Geneva Convention? Should we amend the existing one? Or should we just uh, find another solution? And I think the solution that now is essentially the consensus among nations and within uh, international organizations as well is that the framework that we have may not be perfect, and we probably need to interpret it uh, in light of the new circumstances, but however, we must work with it. We're not going to create a new Geneva Convention. We're not going to amend the existing ones. That's mm. just not realistic. And not today, it sounds almost trivial to say that, and that's what's actually interesting, but for years, there was a debate over this. And today we realize that what we, the laws that we have are the laws that we must use, and we've really tried to reinterpret uh, the existing laws to, to fit the new reality, the modern battlefield. And, uh, and, and that hasn't always led to perfect results. And in very many uh, cases, it has also uh, imposed an additional burden on states uh, who value uh, civil liberties and the dem democratic and the rule of law. Um, uh, but nevertheless, that's the consensus that uh, most nations, if not all, have today uh, agreed upon. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we fight terror. Right. We keep our values. Right. How can, how can laws be effective um, uh, when combating something which is constantly evolving? So, so terrorism is, is something which is constantly evolving. Since the death of uh, uh, bin Laden just uh, over two years ago, Al-Qaeda is in many ways no longer the organization that it, that it used to be. However, uh, many uh, homegrown terrorist mm -hmm. organizations have sp sprung up in many countries around the world mm -hmm. that are maybe targeted less uh, at the West and at creating massive damage or casualty on the scale of September the 11th mm -hmm. and more targeting their own countries and their own governments. How can the laws which you're uh, mentioning be applied to situations like that? And you, you're, all, you're all welcome to, to answer the question. Well, that's exactly, uh, I think I can answer this question in the same way that I answered the previous question. We, we know we're facing a, an evolving threat, just like the wars of uh, in 1949 were not the wars of today. And we will always try, we'll have, this is, this is the challenge and we will have to keep up with this challenge and always uh, try to find a solution that, that using the existing framework and while keeping our values, even though we're fighting an enemy that doesn't abide by these, by these laws, uh, and even though, again, it constrains us, um, the, the uh, Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court said that when we fight terrorism um, in Israel, we fight it with one hand tied behind uh, mm -hmm. our back. And that, the, the, that one hand is the legal framework, and, and that's the challenge again, and yes, it's evolving, but you know, that's the, that's the way any legal challenge is. The law has to have in it, built in it, the mechanisms that allow it to face new challenge and to contend with new realities. It could be the same with criminal law, the same thing with international law, right? Commissioner? Well, I have the same view. I mean, in, in Britain, we're very proud of a, a very open and democratic uh, society, but the world is like uh, a community, isn't it? So with many houses and many families, and families set their own rules. Uh, and it's very hard to say there's going to be an overarching rule in your community that puts rules into your family and tells your family how to be a family. It can't. Mm -hmm. Domestic law will always reflect the society in that country, uh, and you will see politics and legislation will move to try and adapt to the nature of the threat and what it wants its society in its country to be. So if the threat to that country becomes so severe, then it will change its own laws. Mm -hmm. But to then expect a law to reach across the entire world and start governing countries is just unrealistic, I think. Mm -hmm. let, let me highlight it from somewhat of a different perspective without disagreeing with what uh, has been said here. But I'm a bit more pessimistic about the role of law in uh, combating terrorism. Not because it's necessarily ineffective or inefficient, it is actually both. It is slow, it is late, and it's not a device that you would put up front when you fight terrorism. Mm -hmm. It is a device <coughs> that any free society needs to have in order to fight the ongoing uh, flow of terrorism and the threat of terrorism, but this would not be the first or even the second resort that I would look at if I am in the commissioner's position, and I'm not suggesting that I, I want to violate the law, but I'm not looking for the legal solutions as the first items on the agenda. And I'll give you maybe two examples. Patriot One and Patriot Two in the United States were legislated and enacted very quickly, and it's like an aircraft carrier that is turning around but making some mistakes on the way. 
And then there are some changes through the time. But when we're talking about time, a lot of time passes by before you can become effective. Uh, when you look at the different countries, you cannot impose one law on another country's law, and international law is even slower in terms of abiding by it. And if uh, one of the areas that I'm very interested in is the issue of lawfare, mm -hmm. warfare, and incitement. And that is an area that is not as attractive to attention, public attention, legal attention, and media attention, because there isn't the pyrotechnic of the bomb that goes off. So when you have uh, incitement going on, Western societies have a real dilemma in defining what is incitement, in prosecuting incitement, incitement and particularly when that is incitement for genocide, not just incitement against an individual or a group. And that creates a challenge that, frankly, I'm not convinced that Western societies uh, up to this point were able to, to handle it because even when we have conferences like these or the one that we had two months ago, between that and activating a system of, of legal realities and then abiding by that, uh, we're missing a lot in, the, in between. Mm -hmm. Did, can I, there's, there's a very interesting case study to think about in terms of legislation, and that's um, something I spoke about at the conference, and that's the threat of cyber. Mm -hmm. you know, the internet places a challenge of terrorism. It's a great enabler of business, mm -hmm. um, and the whole world is using the internet. You know, everyone is, and we wouldn't want it not to be there. Which is why the intelligence community is trying so <coughs> hard to, to get into the internet and to get into our emails, and to, and be, because the internet yeah, is such I mean, a such an important weapon and, and certainly in britain you know everything that uh, is done to gather intelligence is very heavily regulated through a framework of domestic legislation but the threat that we face through a cyber attack on our infrastructure is very real and yet we have a system there that is ungoverned and unpoliced by any country or any state and you know, there would be a question to have at what point does law try and influence that and could it ever influence mm -hmm. that and my thinking is it probably will never be able to for the reasons the professor said already because it'd be so slow um, and it won't be able to regulate other countries and that's the problem. But a very interesting <coughs> question that arises actually in the context of cyber warfare and, and that ties in really nicely to what we were saying earlier but the uh, ability to evolve with time is for example if, if your state is a victim of a major cyber attack and you mentioned this in your presentation the other day to the point where uh, the economy is completely mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know there's there's no more uh, trains people don't get to work hospitals can't work it, this might even lead to to loss of life etc cetera, etc cetera. does that assuming you can identify who actually targeted you which is, which is a major question in terms of cyber the cyber world uh, what type of response will you be able to take against that uh, that uh, group or individual? And that's that's actually uh, you might say that, that the law comes you know as, as a second thought and not for necessarily as as a first consideration in, in matters of national security. But yet you will have to turn to your legal advisor and say, okay, so in any event, I'd like to know more or less mm -hmm. what does the law enable me to do now? Can I use force? Do I need to use also a cyber attack in response? And and the law has actually dealt with these questions and and has evolved using the existing framework to provide answers to precisely this type of question. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's important to keep in mind as well. You, you're, you're obviously a, a legal expert. Uh, and, and what's interesting to me is that, uh, you know, the laws that have been passed, citizens can read them and know what the government has as its tools. Um, but if we, as we've seen with uh, recent leaks as to the powers that the NSA has mm -hmm. to look into, into our lives, these are things that we don't really know. They're kind of like laws behind a screen and no one really knows what goes on until somebody leaks it. Uh, to what extent do you think it's important for, uh, uh, for people, for citizens to know exactly what powers a government has to uh, deal with terror so that there can be a debate. Uh, first of all, you know, there's a maxim in, in which is no one is supposed to ignore the law, which is a very nice, uh, nice motto. But then, of course, that's uh, putting it on the burden of the citizen. And I don't think I very uh, I know very much what laws actually protect my privacy in Israel or when I'm traveling, etc. But uh, but and, and, and this, I think your question raises the, the, que the problem of the proactiveness. Should we be proactive or reactive? Are we going to wait for the major leak to happen to actually 
take measures? Are we going to wait for the major cyber attack to, uh, uh, to happen to take a measure? Are we going to wait for 9-11 to happen to change the way we think about pretty much anything and everything? And, and that and, and we need to be proactive to 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 and you know that that's how we have to be and I think that's uh, what a person like the commissioner uh, uh, that's the difficulty of the job but 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 that's that's the, that's what we have to do to the extent possible be proactive and of course be reactive when we have to be but try to think ahead. All right, let me maybe try to dispel some of the misconceptions uh, since you mentioned the NSA. <laughs> I don't have any stocks in the NSA, but there's a tendency for moral panics in society, and one of them is uh, maybe an over-exaggeration, if I can use the oxymoron. Uh, when, when you have some sort of a law enforcement measure, such as um, a blimps, they use cameras in the blimps for large events to control them. You'd be shocked to know how many American citizens complain about the invasion of privacy because they cannot base naked in the courtyard. Well, if they think that the officer up there is looking exactly at the, their yard, they are mistaken. But the point is that the need to be checks and balances so that an officer doesn't simply go to a computer and if I met <coughs> Daphna in a, in a bar and I know her name, now I'm going to the computer terminal and I'm saying, okay, what do you know about Daphna? I can go to Google and probably find a lot more information. <laughs> but the, 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 the point being made is that the NSA, for example, is not looking at your email in terms of breaching your privacy. What it does is mining data and that is a whole different conceptual approach and and you can say well it's in a sense it's an invasion of privacy but it's not taking anything that you had privately exchanged that is of an intimate nature or family nature or a personal nature but if the algorithms come up with information that connects what you exchanged with some formula that they found elsewhere that raises a red flag. Between that and invasion of privacy, there's a very long way to go. Now, to make life a little bit more complicated than what I just described, in the West generally, there is a distrust of government. It is true in Israel. It is true in the United States. I do not know the situation in, in you know, in the United Kingdom it is true also. or in Europe. <laughs> but all, all, all over, the, the, you know, the citizens don't rank <laughs> trust and confidence in government very high. When you combine these two issues of, geez, the NSA is looking into my underwear, and you, then you look at all these kinds of behavior, it raises public panics that I'm not so sure ought to be justified because if I would be in the shoes of civil liberties advocates, I want to look in the mirror and say, if I blame the NSA today will I, for invasion of my privacy, would I also blame them tomorrow if they're unable to prevent the next attack? Right. And that's, and that's precisely why the debate is, <coughs> is so important. It is. But, I mean, I, there are a number of things that come out of the conversation, um, which I just broadly agree with, really. Um, we, we, the, the first question you said is, should the public know? Well, actually, some things the public can never know, and that's the fact that some issues in any country are secret, and they're secret because if other people knew what we knew or know how we do business, then our capability is destroyed as well. Mm -hmm. You know, And we are about trying to protect citizens and protect lives. Mm -hmm. So some things have to be secret. There's a natural tension, and earlier on in this discussion, we talked about the balance between human rights and civil liberties and the need for a government to protect its citizens. And there should be a tension. You know, That tension should be with challenge coming into any government at any time to make sure you know, they are held to account. You know, and I actually have a lot of confidence in my government for doing that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I think British society does. But of course, it doesn't mean to say there isn't tension, and there should be that tension. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't necessarily think the voice we hear sometimes of civil liberties is the majority view either, mm -hmm. is the other point. The majority view, I think, think they're pretty comfortable. Um, the challenge is not knowing what are the government doing, but do you have enough rules and laws in your country that the government have to, or the government I'm using, maybe the police or the security service, must comply with. Mm -hmm. And then how much confidence do you have that they are complying with their own rules and laws? Mm -hmm. That's the challenge of the citizen. You know, what are the rules that people say they can't step over this line? Not, I need to know everything you're doing. That can never happen. 
you're you're all here at an international conference uh, and you all come from a different country uh, uh, kind of thinking individually perhaps about uh, uh, terrorism and then uh, coming together at a conference like this uh, it, it raises the question to me how important on a daily basis is international cooperation uh, when dealing with uh, with terrorism well I cannot emphasize enough how important <coughs> international uh, cooperation is. And actually, I would quote uh, Boaz Ganor, Dr. Boaz Ganor, who coined the statement that you need a network to beat a network. Mm -hmm. The head of the uh, ICT. Yes. And, and, and the fact of the matter is that no one is an island to itself. No single police of officer, no single police department can do the job without knowing what the business community knows, without knowing what civic associations know, without working closely with other government agencies, with peer law enforcement agencies, uh, within the country and outside. That's why you have international organizations. But beyond that, you need to know, A, how somebody else does business mm -hmm. and what kind of information is available to them that is of value to you. Uh, I, I'll probably give uh, two examples, one from Israel and one from the United States. In, in Israel, it took the security services quite a long time to move the cards from being very close to the chest to opening them up, at least to sister agencies. And today, uh, the country got to a point where real on-time, online information can be done in seconds, not in days or weeks or, or months, including from the intelligence to the command of an operation, and it's quite successful. Right. You can now apply to Mossad online. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, uh, in the United States, it's a more difficult process because a lot of people think that law enforcement in the world is uh, modeled after the United States. The United States actually is an exception. Mm -hmm. The multi-jurisdictional structure of U.S. law enforcement is both an inhibitor and an accelerator to exchange information. But in 9-11, we saw it as an inhibitor. And not only that, but the command post and the 911 center and the intelligence fusion center that, that the New York PD had was destroyed in the attack. And it took a while to, to get that back. There's still distrust between the FBI and NYPD. And they have feuds that are probably less public, but, but they are there. Um, it takes a long time, and I think we're on the right track, to regain that trust and to uh, cooperate. Because eventually, most of the information comes from local sources from people who are alert enough to then bring that information to the, inf the knowledge of the police departments and act. There's a famous story in Israel about an 80-year-old grandma who was on a civil guard duty, and she's the one who stopped a 500-kilogram bomb truck uh, or lorry in, in, in England. <laughs> it's, it's just absolutely unbelievable. In the United States, law enforcement is still seen is a product that you buy in a supermarket, you pay for it, whether it's public or private, and it's the role of the law enforcement to deal with it. And the community is not still a key player as much as probably should be. Mm -hmm. um, the, the actually, uh, the international cooperation, I was thinking about uh, one area in which it's been pr so it's significant in general, and I definitely agree. Uh, I think one area where we can pinpoint it as having made night and day difference is in fighting the movement of funds uh, and the financing of terrorism. That the only way that that can be f uh, um, um, contended with is if states exchange information and come together under a single umbrella and actually uh, sure. uh, alert each other of movements of funds, and, and, and that's actually been working. So I think that's an area in which, uh, in which cooperation has been key, absolutely key. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Thank you all so much for uh, for joining us at 106.2 FM. Uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and come up with great solutions <laughs> for the Thank benefit you. of to us all. To all these problems. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you.